Shalom Chabrim, I'm Stephen Ben Dunoon, and you're watching Dunoon Institute of Biblical Research, a production of IsraelReturns.com. And I was, the other day, I don't even really know how to start this here, I was preparing for a message, and of course I, I used some scriptures from the book of Job, and and while I was reading in, in the book of Job, as I was looking at this message here, there were certain verses that caught my eye. And I just felt in my heart, I need to go back and, and read Job. And uh, so last night I began, and I got to, um, oh, probably about the eighth chapter. But when I got into the third chapter, Job is distraught over, his, over the very day that he was ever born. And he's expressing his heart and the way he feels about this because he's totally unaware of what debate that God is having with Satan, God's pleasure with Job, we, we would say, because he has stood for the Lord. He was a righteous man in all of his generation. There was none like Job. And the Lord was very proud of Job. He was, he was happy to see that he had a, a son uh, of God that would stand for him regardless of the circumstances. And he knew that Job would never curse him no matter what evil might come upon him. Of course, Satan had different thoughts and he believed that Job would curse him if he allowed him to lower the hedge that was built around him, uh, so to speak, the wall, we might call it, uh, and allow him to touch him financially, physically, everything you could possibly imagine. And in the course of all the evil that was happening to Job, and now Job, in this particular part, his body has been afflicted with boils from the head, crown of his head to the very soles of his feet. And um, his three friends are coming to uh, mourn with him and also to try to give him counsel. But Job says something here that really struck my, my heart. And I know that there have probably been other people that have, maybe have already noticed this. There have been other people, no doubt, especially... Um, people that have lost children or, and, and we even know there's other scriptures regarding losing the life of a child. But when I read this, I was so troubled in my heart because I feel like that there's someone that listens to this ministry or perhaps will stumble across this ministry in the course of watching this video that needs to hear this. And regardless of other people that have done videos on, say, a miscarriage of a child or children that have, that have died in the womb or, or abortions or whatever the case may be where it's an unborn, the death of an unborn child or the death of a little small child, what happens to that child? And parents, especially in the case of abortion, women that have grieved continuously because of the loss of that child and the guilt that they feel, but yet... Let me just first assure you, if you're a sister that has gone through this, or even if you're a husband and wife that have gone through this, maybe in your younger years or whatever the case may be, there is still mercy. God still forgives. And the most beautiful part is, is the child that was either aborted, the child that was through a miscarriage, the little child, no matter what the state of the, the, the little fellow may have been, if he was, you have to remember, like, like God said about Jeremiah, I knew thee before you ever conceived in your mother's womb, and I sanctified you to be a prophet to the nations. God has foreknowledge. And if he knew Jeremiah before he was ever formed in the womb and sanctified him to be a prophet of the nations. He knew that because in his heart he knew it. He knew that there would be this certain man and certain woman that would come together and have a child and the child would be born and this would be his purpose in life. So how could we think then that a child though that is maybe miscarried, the mother, her body, something happens and maybe two or three months into the pregnancy, maybe even only a couple of weeks and then she loses the baby and mothers are distraught over these things. And I know there's somebody, I mean, I don't say this, you know, sometimes you hear people say things like that. I know somebody's out there and they're watching and they're going through, they're going through heart trouble or whatever. And to me, sometimes it just bothers me because I feel like people are just making these things up. But when I read what I'm about to read you now, my heart became burdened and I had to make a video regarding this because 
someone that knows our ministry, this has been bothering them. I don't know why, but I just feel that in my heart. And, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's not the case. But I, I have a feeling that we're going to find that out. Anyway, I want to take you real quick over to the book of Job. Like I said, Job is grieving over the very, his very birth. And in the 11th verse, he says, Why did I not die from the womb? Why did I not perish when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees receive me? You ever know back in the ancient times, women would give birth on their knees, literally. In fact, it's, it's kind of ironic. Today, we've seen a statue in Europe here. A woman that was pregnant was on her knees, ready to give birth. And my wife was explaining that to me. And at first, I had a different conception. But she said, no, this is the way it was. Uh, you know, my wife was a midwife, so a nurse midwife. So she knows these things. She said, no, this is the way it was done in the old days. And so he says... Or why, uh, excuse me, why did the knees receive me? Or why the breast that I should suck? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. Now let me just share with you in Hebrew real quick what he says here at the very beginning when I said, why did I not die from the womb? In Hebrew he says, Lama lo merchim amot mi betan. Literally, he is talking about why didn't he die Basically, while he was still in his mother's womb. So, Job is literally dealing with a death that could happen either when you're still in the womb or when he came. Because the next one is when he says, Why did I not perish when I came out of the belly? One was dying in the womb, the other was dying while, when he first, when he comes out. So many women suffer with this. And even, no doubt, the husbands, nothing like the women that suffer, though, because of some other, it's, as my wife often describes it, your children are right under your heart. So for them, it's difficult. Far more than the man. The man it's, doesn't have that emotional attachment like a woman does. Not to say they don't. I mean, no doubt, a man and a wife, they're having a child and they miscarry, the child miscarries and then they're grieved over the fact that the child miscarries. But it's important that you understand here. Job is actually talking about this and he's saying, you know, why did he not die then? Because then watch what he says. He says, um, for now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then had I been at rest with kings. And counselors of the earth who build desolate places for themselves or with princes that had gold who filled their houses with silver or as a hidden untimely birth I had not been as infants that never saw light again he deals with the child that never is even born then watch what he says about where they go there the wicked cease from troubling in other words there's no evil where they go. They're at rest with kings and princes. Do you know the Bible says that when certain kings die or something like the David, he says, you will, you will sleep with your fathers. Yeshua said when, when he was here, Jesus said about Lazarus, he said, he sleepeth. And they thought, well, if he sleeps, he does. Well, he says, no, he's dead. He talked to him in plain language. But death is not like you would think. It's not like you just, oh, you're just nothing anymore. As even Job saw, he would be resting with kings and princes. He said, there the wicked cease from troubling. There the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They hear not the voice of the slave driver. The small and great are there. And the servant is free from his master. I mean, the greatest hope of any mother that has ever suffered or perhaps a mother that for some reason unknown to us went through the horror of making the decision or maybe forced in it or coerced into it of aborting a child God still loves you just the same it certainly is not his will that this would happen 
but his arms are open for mercy for even those. And it's not just a mother, believe me. If a, if a mother has to abort a child, there's more to it than that. And I know that. God knows that. Pressures, circumstances, all kinds of things that weigh in there. But God is a merciful God. Sometimes Satan, after these things, we do these things in life, he comes and he's, he's not only the one that convinces us to do the evil acts that happen in life, but then after we do something wrong, he's there to accuse us as well and to bring a spirit of condemnation upon you. He, he's the kind of guy that will take and talk you into robbing someone and after you've robbed the person a day or two later, then he's also the guy. Now, it's not to say that God won't bring conviction. God brings conviction as well. But Satan is the kind of guy that then, even after a person has repented or made something right or made restitution or gone before God, you know, in the case like we're talking, if it's a woman that, is, uh, that has gone through an abortion or something like that, and she's so repented before the Lord, but yet something keeps making her feel bad about it. Satan is a master of bringing condemnation where there has been freedom and liberty. You're not a slave to Satan's tactics on your mind. God has set you free today. And if you're listening and you are going through that struggle over the loss of a child, I'm telling you now, you are free indeed. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, what he shed for you at Calvary. And that little child, whether it was from a miscarriage or an act that was intentional, is resting in the presence of Almighty God with kings and princes. Kings like David, like Solomon, Hezekiah, and Yeshua, the Lord Jesus, he is the Prince of Peace. So these children are in his presence. And now you have a scripture from the book of Job in the third chapter, the 11th verse, right on down into the 18th verse. Why did I not die from the womb? Why did I not perish when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should suck? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then had I been at rest with kings and counselors. Sorry, I was thinking princess counselors. Jesus is still the counselor too. He's a counselor, prince of peace. That's why I had it in my mind, prince. Counselors of the earth. See? And when he says, and who built desolate places for themselves... That's because there's no continuing city on this earth. So it doesn't have anything to do with them being a bad counselor or a bad king. We're just in a, we're in a world that there's no continuing city. I hope that gives you comfort today. And the Lord just would not let me rest until I brought this message to you. God bless you. God have mercy on us for all that we have ever done in our past or done wrong. And God be with you. And just remember one day soon, you'll be united with a little fellow that left this life. Maybe so many years ago for you, or maybe just only weeks or days ago. You'll meet them again, but they're resting kings and counselors. I'm Stephen Benton with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. God bless you.